Before I get started, I just I want to say a couple things. Uh, one is that I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking about myself a little bit more than I like to today. Um, but really, the, the food that comes out of our kitchen, uh, there's almost nothing that one person alone produced it from beginning to end. So a lot of times when you hear me saying uh, I, it really means we. We all kind of share in the, uh, the, the creative process and, and the burden that is black sauce. Uh, and then the other thing I want to say is just, I uh, just want to give a quick shout to my son who drew this picture. something is to maintain it in its existing state, right? And uh, it's essentially to stave off its death, to try to keep it from some terrible or permanent end, or just, just being forgotten. And a lot of times the way that we do this is we render something still. Because um, once it's still, you can kind of capture it and, and you have that moment. I think there's a, there's a lot of ways that people do this. Uh, Photography is one of the ones that I think is the best. And uh, with photography, a lot of times you can you can you can capture something, make it still, and then you have that image to look back on. Uh, you're going to see some pretty incredible photographic images in some of these slides, but uh, I didn't take any of them because the fact is I I don't really think like that. Um, I don't know that I have the capacity to think like that. I, there's been very few times in my life where I had a conversation with myself, like, yo, son, you need to take a picture of this. <laughs> um, my mind doesn't really work that way. And so whatever, whatever urgency compels a person to look through the lens or the shutter and say, like, I gotta get a picture of this so I can look back on it later, um, I just, I don't really have that. At some point, every single week, every week, uh, I'm at a cutting board and maybe I'm boning a pork loin or uh, slicing through a crate of apples. And somebody, by somebody, I, I mean Laura, <laughs> or Denzel, who got a phone out right now taking a picture. <laughs> Somebody comes in and, and looks at that same, that same pile of bones or, or apple cores and then takes a picture. So honestly, 19 times out of 20, even though I created that pile of stuff and I was standing next to it the whole time, it never occurred to me that I should try to preserve it in a photograph. And, and maybe 16 times out of 20, I'm, I'm focused enough on what I'm doing that uh, I don't even notice the person taking the picture. Uh, something else I don't do particularly well as far as preserving is cataloging or archiving recipes. Now, now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I don't use recipes at all. I do. I do use them. Uh, but from very early on, when I felt like I might make a living with food, I found myself to be much more captivated, much more interested in the process, the, the technique, the skills, uh, and then sort of general understanding about how food works together, all the things that underlie a recipe. Uh, so I would, I'd buy, I started off just buying ingredients. I, I'd buy stuff that I, I was familiar with, some stuff I wasn't as familiar with, mangoes, lemongrass, uh, turmeric, ginger, hibiscus, oysters, salt cod, and I'd buy it one week, uh, my wife can attest to this, and then the very next week I was buying it again and I was making it differently. Can I extract more flavor out of this by grating it or chopping it? Um, should I pound it in a mortar and pestle? Should I use a food processor? But all along I've been really, 
really fascinated by technique, and that's how I tried to bolster my knowledge about food. And I'm still that way. It's still how we operate. To be honest with you, we have two recipes that we use week in and week out, just two. One is a recipe for brine, and the other, uh, probably pretty obviously, is for biscuits. But I don't want to disappoint y'all, but I'm just going to be honest. The biscuit recipe did not get passed down by my great-grandmother in Mississippi. <laughs> It's really just kind of a formula, something that, you know, we tweaked it over time, and it still gets tweaked, even today. If, if it's more humid in the kitchen, if it's hotter in the kitchen, if the intended use of what we're making is going to be a little bit different, then the recipe, too, might get changed a little bit. But, uh, as you might imagine, this can be a problem in my line of work, not having recipes. If I want to replicate something, but then I, I can't offer a person a, a blueprint to replicate that, um, that causes some tension sometimes. Sometimes it bubbles over into an argument in the kitchen. Uh, sometimes it manifests like I'll, I'll go to the bathroom or I'll go to get some water and when I come back, somebody's hustling to cover up what they did. <laughs> Now they're doing it the way they want to do it, which they can, right, if I haven't provided them with a blueprint. Sometimes the way the tension manifests is that somebody will, will eventually cop a notebook and start to record recipes in it. Record recipes for all of us. Um, recipes that now we can, we can refer to. Recipes that are now preserved, essentially. But there is one way that I preserve, that I, I do it pretty well, I'm, I'm pretty diligent about it, and that's canning. The, the deal with food is, it's real ephemeral. Uh, sometimes we get a crate of something on a Saturday at the farmer's market. If I haven't used it by Wednesday, and you know, my brother wants to get a couple of days of rest in the beginning of the week, if I haven't used it by Wednesday, it's already changing. Food's real ephemeral. If I want to utilize something when it's truly at its best, i got to find it during the season, during the moment, uh, when it's at its peak. And I have to figure out a way to put it up to save it for later. So every spring, Without fail, I uh, I got to pickle ramps, asparagus, spring onions, rhubarb. That's every spring. Those things are only going to be here for a short time. Strawberries, if I can get to them. Uh, every summer, I got to preserve figs. I got to find time for peaches, cherry tomatoes. Apricots, if they survive, because the, the weather around here is real fickle. Okra, if it's not too woody. And then in the fall, without fail, I got to get to apples, leeks, and onions. I got to get some of all those things in a jar. But the thing is, and, and this is a large part of what I want to talk about, preserving that way is not really like photography. I can't render food still. Um, if you're preserving something with salt, smoke, dehydration, vinegar, microorganisms, whatever, you, whatever it is that you're doing, that, that food's still changing, still in the process of changing. Uh, so I guess what I'm doing is kind of like, kind of shepherding a slow chemical change more than I'm actually making something still. The asparagus that, that I put into a jar last week, it's only going to be asparagus in name. Six or 12 or 18 months from now when I pop the top off the jar and make pickled asparagus frites. It's not going to be a vibrant, vibrant green, crisp stalk like it is now. It's going to be pale. Uh, it's going to have several dimensions of sour. It's not going to have the same predictability. But it's also going to be worldlier 
and it's going to be something that's tangibly different. So I, I, maybe I misspoke a little bit. I said I'm good at this kind of preservation. I didn't start out good at it. Uh, it requires a lot more planning than what I'm used to. I see a lot of people in the audience uh, that know me pretty well. I see Ben back there. People who know me professionally, Laura, my God, who know I'm not that organized. You know, I do the best I can with what I have, but I'm not. I'm not a super organized person. Preserving the way that I do it, it requires some planning. It requires me to think about what what, what do I need today to serve this dish in November. And not serve this dish for four people, but maybe serve it for 240 people. Uh, how much of this do I need to make sure that, that we've got enough from now until the next time farmers are pulling the same thing out of the ground next year? And then there's this other question that nags at me all the time, which is, uh, am I preserving it just because it's here, or am I actually doing something that's going to make it better? Am I adding some value to it? I mean, a really ripe peach in July, it's juicy, it's fleshy, it's got a very distinct taste. It's hard to, it's hard to beat that, it's hard to improve on that. So am I just gonna drop some in a jar with some vinegar? No. Uh, but maybe I can pull each, each wedge of that peach off of the pit, give it a short stint in the smoker, uh, think carefully about what kind of smoke we're using as fragrance for that and then preserve it with some sugar and some acid and that smoke and that savory that we put in it and, and then try to pair it well with some of the other things that we do. It's, uh, it's a process that, that, requires, that requires some thought. Um, one more example is that Vinegar, this, this is something that happens all the time in the kitchen. Uh, we use vinegar from what we've already pickled. I have never encountered any vinegar in any bottle, on any shelf, in any grocery store that matches the taste of vinegar that's been sitting in a jar pickling some leeks or some onions for the last year. And so if I make a salad dressing from that today, the salad genuinely tastes like I started it you know, in 2018. <laughs> uh, so, so speaking of 2018, uh, last year, last year was a year when preserves really started to take on a newer, more profound meaning for me. Uh, it was a Thursday in March. I arrived at the kitchen at about 6 a.m. Pretty normal time for me, and. Uh, the very first thing I did to start my morning was I started a fire in the smoker. And then while, while the hardwood was kind of transitioning to coal, so I grabbed 20 racks of lamb ribs out of the refrigerator so they could kind of come to room temperature before putting them in the smoker. The ribs had been seasoned the previous day. Um, mustard, coriander, black cumin, Turbinado sugar, salt, pepper, garlic. But <laughs> mustard, coriander, turbinado sugar, black cumin, kosher salt, black pepper, and garlic. But the legacy of those ribs actually started much longer than just the previous day, much longer before that. Um, each time we get a lamb yolk into the kitchen, the, the yolk of the lamb is, is essentially a front half or front third of the lamb. Each time we get a lamb yolk, we have to break it down. We use the neck, the shoulders, and the shanks. And we braise those, and then we have braised lamb for the farmer's market. We serve it with an egg or smoked feta. You guys have had it. But off of each yolk, we only get two racks of ribs. Two racks of ribs. Uh, 
it probably takes three, possibly four yokes to have enough braised lamb meat for a farmer's market, which means at max we're getting eight racks of ribs from, from that, that cycle of production. So then we gotta kind of painstakingly vacuum seal and freeze each rack. We gotta have room to do that. Or essentially, you know, I had essentially preserved those ribs just to get to that point in the morning anyway. And then after a few months, we have a critical mass of ribs where we can put them on a menu. Um, about 7.15, a couple other people came in the kitchen and we really, we really sort of stepped up our production. Uh, brioche for the oxtail sandwiches. More brioche for the sticky buns. A couple kinds of roti dough. As usual, um, I made the, the menu a little bit more labor intensive than I had to. <laughs> we kind of kind of breezed through uh, a busy lunch and then also a busy dinner service. And then at about 9:48 p.m., we closed up shop for the night after washing dishes to some ratchet music. <laughs> A little after midnight, I got a call from the alarm company, and they said the building was on fire. And they were sorry. I was a little disoriented. I went back to the kitchen. And I'm definitely not going to spend a lot of time talking about what I saw there or what I felt. Because I still have some emotions tied up in it. But we lost a lot. For insurance purposes, it was deemed a total loss. We lost ovens, stoves, uh, the smoker. But besides the equipment, which is all stuff you can get back, we lost a collection of several hundred books. Um, you know, books that had handwritten notes and reflections in them. We lost recipe notebooks, which is ironic, because a lot of people had to fight me for us to even have those notebooks. And the whole purpose was to preserve, you know, our recipes. We lost those. Um, in addition to the fire and smoke damage, the fire department put thousands of gallons of water into the building. So cast iron pans, wood blocks, wood countertops, devastated. And you know, now I had to figure out how do I pick up all the pieces? <coughs> Feeling like we lost everything. So, so, so two amazing things happened. Um, the first thing that happened is just, man, the people around us really rallied to support us. I see a lot of you in this room. Shit, is that my phone? <laughs> Our, you know, my family, first of all, Team Black Sauce, second of all, um, neighboring businesses, actually businesses throughout the city were incredible. People offering us refrigeration space, uh, storage space, everything you can think of. I don't even know how they knew so fast. Three in the morning I was getting messages. And then certainly, you know, I can't forget our customers were, were, were incredible. This, the second thing that happened is that uh, either I or Laura opened the door of the walk-in fridge and our entire stash of preserves survived. Yeah. So, 
I mean, I hate to try to tie this together with some corny metaphor about preserves. <laughs> um, but the fact, you know, the fact is that businesses, shit, lives are as ephemeral as the food that we're making. And there was, there was, there were some snapshots of what Black Sauce was before the fire and some snapshots of who we were after the fire. But that, that process, that process that's happening over time, that slow change, um, there's really no one photograph that documents that, that illuminates that. So I, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about who we were and how were we gonna stay those same people. And, you know, I, I can't, I don't know that I can put into words what makes us authentic to some of you people. Um, but there's certainly a, a sincerity with which we approach food. Uh, the pickling is a huge part of that because it gives us, it gives us a power and a self-sufficiency um, to create a menu from scratch, like from, from thought, from imagination, all the way through to the other side without having to outsource something small like ketchup or barbecue sauce or jam. Uh, those, that's, that's part of what gives us the ability and in, and in fact the responsibility uh, to be who we are. And the last, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, if, if I was somebody else, maybe we'd be at the market writing on a chalkboard that we were selling y'all pre-fire preserves, but we just don't do that over here. That's it.